we are going to be looking at issues relating to managing security sector resources. Managing resources is definitely an integral part of domestic and civilian governance. Good governance of the security sector results in allocative efficiency, which is another dimension of what Dr. Ashish Malakish was describing, the opportunity course. When we spend on one thing, we give up the opportunity to spend on something else. If we manage security resources well, we are spending on the items that will yield the greatest output as measured by our national security strategy. We want to have resources used to support the priorities that are outlined in that national security strategy. But how do we get there? I recall many years ago, I was uh, visiting Venezuela and I was arriving together with another professor who was coming from Europe. He had never been in Venezuela and Caracas before. And our driver got lost and said, oh, I don't know where the entrance to the highway is. And this professor, who actually had been a mathematician, looked off into the distance, saw the highway, and said to her, based on the patterns that I'm seeing there, your entry must be right here. And he was right. He understood where we were going, and he also had an understanding of how the laws of traffic flow would guide you there from where we were sitting. And to me, it's an example of how having that strategic vision can help you today. So what we're talking about today are strategies, but those strategies will influence our planning. And just as the traffic flows based on some laws of physics, our decisions will be guided by values. And that's the other thing that you mentioned this morning, Dr. Joel, the, the importance of values. And those values show through in the laws, the rules and regulations that will contain and guide our policy. By following these laws and rules and the basic principles of public financial management, you will end up with better security, a stronger democracy and sustainable development. You follow the budget law, the principles of resource management, and budget protocols to get a budget process that reinforces good governance and professional ethics. At the end of this process, you will monitor and evaluate what you've achieved in your implementation. And that information will feed back so that you're always refining the work that you do so that you end up with what I call a sound practice. I can't say best practice because if there are so many countries, how can there just be one approach, one solution? When each country has its own set of values its own challenges, its own threats, its own opportunities. If you follow the principles, you will be able to shape a strategy, a security strategy 
that reflects the values of your citizens and uses the resources available in the best way. For you, that would be the sound practice of governing the country that yields both security and development. This morning, Dr. Joel spoke about values. What I'd like to say that when we translate some of those values, some of the ethics of expenditure management, we have a set of principles and those principles guide all of our decisions. Now, if you turn to the the book on securing development on page 107, you'll see a detailed description of each of those values. I'd like to focus just on a few of them. The first one is comprehensiveness. The budget must include all government revenues and all government expenditures. There should be no off budget items. Why not? Because if something is done outside of the budget process, it's not controlled, it's not held to the same standard of meeting our objectives. And so it's basically lost some of its value. So all items should be included in revenue and expenditure so that planning, control, and oversight cover all the activities, sustaining the priorities that were outlined in the national security strategy. The second principle is one of discipline. And I think this morning we heard the speakers talk about a resource sensitivity. So you plan something, you plan to do something because you know you have the capacity to do it. You know that you can go a certain distance because you have enough petrol to take you there. It makes no sense to plan to do something that's beyond your capabilities. And as Dr. Assis said, if we're looking outside for resources, then we end up with other challenges and other problems. So discipline, it means you have a hard budget constraint and you honor that constraint. Towards the end, you see a reference to transparency. By that, we mean that the public knows all the roles and responsibilities of all the public institution. And the public should also have access to information that informs budget decisions. And we know that when we're talking about the security sector, that some of that information will be confidential. It will be only for those who need to know it. Nevertheless, most information can be shared with the public so that they are able to influence how you spend the money and what you spend it on. Accountability means that all the expenditures must be voted for and authorized by competent authorities and that there are clear rules for all of the budget managers and that those managers give regular reports to the legislature, to the independent audit, and to other oversight bodies. This is again to ensure that public funds support the public interests. This is, um, for many of us, a, a familiar diagram. Uh, it was taken from a world bank book securing development, but it actually is much older and it comes from um, a diagram that Nicole Ball and others developed years ago. It keeps on reappearing because it conveys some important information. And we're fortunate that Dr. Fairley Chapui 
has made it even more valuable by putting the national security strategy right there in the middle. She has pointed out that that is the hub and that everything else revolves around the strategy. That strategy is informing all of our priorities and the sectoral allocations in the security budget. Now, we've already said that the budget process is governed by the principles of public expenditure management. And the principle of discipline requires that we consider revenues and expenditures together. Uh, that outer circle is the national budget and it actually represents a budget envelope. The envelope is our assured revenue. Those are the revenues that we know we can count on during this budget year. Now, planning the security sector budget, which is the second one with the blue arrows, requires that you understand all the dimensions of the national security strategy and that you okay, know the strategy mm -hmm. was actually developed by an inclusive process, starting with the definition of security, which may be different from one country to another or from one region to another. Uh, General Moniki just spoke of a region where security meant having adequate water. So the definition of security will be different from place to place. And that definition of security drives the strategies, defines what instruments you can use. And here in the budget, you are providing the resources for that. And when I say resources, we may be talking about personnel, equipment, and related to personnel is perhaps one of the most important resources, training. So what are the resources you have? How do they fit together? And how are they all uh, united to meet the objectives of the natural, national security strategy? And this security strategy, is it's not a document. It's a process, a process that identifies the resources needed and when they will be available and defines the sectors that contain those resources structured in a way to provide the appropriate instruments of security. We spoke before about that outer ring, which is the entire budget process and we move through that cycle from in the beginning, one, two, three priorities and objectives to the preparation of the budget and then to the implementation. We're talking about procurement, purchasing equipment, actually making the plans for training. And not all of the information related to the security sector is confidential, but some of the procedures and training um, may be. And so they would be kept in separate documents. Implementing those planned activities and revenue mobilization are soon followed by the monitoring and evaluation. And if the activities include several sectors, that might be several sectors within security, you have to be sure that you've all agreed on how you're going to measure and how you will evaluate so that you have a, a joint assessment and can have the proper. That process of monitoring and evaluation begins during the implementation and the principles of public expenditure management guide us through that accounting system and this and a system of 
expenditure controls. Now, these are controls that structure the process of budgeting, but also, very importantly, structure the process of procurement. Country systems are different. General Mwaniki talked about inheriting a certain system from the colonial government. Others in the continent have different types of systems. But even though the actors, the procedures may be different, all of those systems are designed to support the principles that we mentioned before. So whether you're in a system where the Ministry of Finance is the most important actor, or you're in a system like that, uh, that General Mwaniki is in, where a lot of attention is paid to the first set of controls, who's authorized, and the final set of controls, who does the payments, Whatever the system is, however it's set up, it's all designed to do the same thing and to carry you there, meeting those principles. And absolutely essential to all of these systems is an independent audit. Someone who comes by and assures that you have spent the money in the way it was authorized to be spent. And hopefully your country also has an active parliament that will assure that that money was spent in a way that is meant to meet your national security strategy. There have to be clear systems of accountabilities. Oversight is important, especially in the security sector. As you know, we've seen countries where the misuse of resources in the security sector has actually contributed to conflict because the soldiers didn't have the right equipment. They weren't able to defend um, the national territory and the country was then overrun by those who um, were able to be more effective in the use of force. So security means not only having the right personnel, but they should be trained properly. It also means recognizing that security is more than defense. It includes issues related to health, to environmental degradation and resources, and also education. Anyone who's tried to recruit when the young people in their country are not fit and are not educated understands how much recruitment and the security sector are related to other parts. We also are fortunate that there are other outside uh, organizations and civil society organizations that monitor the performance of African development and African security. Uh, I believe this morning, Dr. Malakiesh mentioned the Ibrahim Index is one of those, um, but there is also an international budget partnership that focuses on transparency and actually creating people's budgets. Sometimes they may look like comic books, but there's a simple explanation of the budget so that the people of the country can see whether the budget is being used to help them to get to that state of development and security that they value, that they feel is important. Those evaluations take place, they inform the planning process, and the entire cycle begins once again. 
And so what we've seen then is that strategy and planning are absolutely critical parts of governance of the security sector. But what we've seen most of all, and I think you've spoken about this in terms of leadership at every step of the way, is that values and ethics underpin and support every part of the governance process. So I look forward to your questions and um, hope that we will both uh, learn a little more about this challenging topic. 